Well, that was a giant waste of time. Today's video is brought to you by Manscaped and the Performance Package 4.0. It may be winter time here in the Northern Hemisphere, but that doesn't mean you should let nature reclaim the land. With Manscaped, you'll have all the right tools to keep your season looking bright. The Lawnmower 4.0 is IP67 rated, so you can cut around the tree even if the weather outside is frightful. The included wireless charger also means it's ready to go whenever you are. You'll also get the Weed Whacker 2.0 to take care of any ear and nose hair, which helps me avoid that Father Time look in my mid-30s. I'm personally a big fan of the Crop Reviver for keeping your balls clean, as well as the Crop Preserver for keeping them dry. With Manscaped, you can make sure your ornaments keep looking like they're hung with care. Go to manscaped.com slash craftcomputing to get 20% off, free international shipping, plus two additional free gifts. That's manscaped.com slash craftcomputing, and remember, your balls will thank you. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. As much as I love prosumer and enterprise network gear, sometimes you just need something cheap to get a job done. A friend of mine was looking for a few outdoor wireless access points that could act as either a standalone AP or as a repeater to avoid having to run several hundred feet of Cat6 wire across his farm. While I would have preferred to deploy a Ubiquiti Mesh AP, they would have been massively overkill for this project. We're talking, we just want Wi-Fi for our phones and a couple tablets while we're 500 feet away from the house. So this isn't exactly a business critical installation. Trying to keep the project as inexpensive as possible, I stumbled onto the Wavelink 300 megabit outdoor Wi-Fi range extenders. At only $30, they boast some pretty decent specs. With 802.11 and 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, outdoor and weather sealed enclosures, power over ethernet capable, and they come with the PoE injector. They're also capable of being used as a standalone router for DHCP or DNS, as a wireless access point, or as a repeater for mesh deployment. Look, I'm not saying these are the most capable access points in the world, and I can already hear you complaining about the lack of 5 GHz radios. But let's break it down this way. While 5 GHz is capable of faster speeds, it also typically halves the range of an access point compared to 2.4. And in an outdoor setting, where the goal is to simply not use cellular data, I'd say this fits the goals of this project perfectly. Now, I've already had the experience of setting two of these up, but I figured I'd save the third for you fine folks at home. So, let's see what comes in the box, what the installation process is like, and finally, how well does it perform? Alright, let's go ahead and open this thing up. So inside the box, we have the wireless access point itself, which is made of pretty sturdy plastic. I'm going to assume this is uh, injection molded ABS. On the bottom, if we take this threaded coupling off, we've got our RJ45 jack, a grounding lug, and the reset button for the access point. Also inside this cap is the weather sealing coupling right here. Now this is designed to thread your Cat5 or Cat6 cable through and plug into the access point, and then finally seal up with the base right here, keeping it sealed from both the elements and bugs. I've deployed some wireless access points outdoors before and come back to hornet's nests in them. So keeping every manner of living creature and moisture out definitely gets a thumbs up in my book. And on the top, we've got our two SMA antenna ports complete with rubber couplings on the bottom to help keep moisture out from that threaded connector. On the side, it does include a pair of very beefy antennas that screw right into the top of the unit and honestly look pretty attractive. And they feel substantial. This is not just plastic. There's actually metal running all the way through this. So uh, I'm hoping for some pretty decent results as far as reception goes. Yeah, not bad. Other items inside the box include a three foot Cat5e cable, the very tiny power over ethernet injector, as well as the power adapter for it. We've got some drywall anchors for mounting the unit itself our instruction manual, as well as the wall slash pole mount. So you could either screw this into the wall and hang it, or you can strap it to a pole with the included very nice beefy zip ties. So let me go ahead and get this thing plugged into a computer. I'll walk through the setup process and then we'll do a little bit of testing. Stay tuned. All right, uh, it's been a long time since my desk looked something like this. So we have our power over ethernet injector connected to wall power, as well as an ethernet cable going down to my laptop here. The other end of that cable is being plugged into the Wavelink access point, and you can see it's providing both power and data. So now we should be ready to get this thing all set up. First step is open up a web browser, and we're going to browse to the native IP address, which is, ah, 
It is DNS-based. It is wifi.wavelink.com. Uh, from experience, that always works first time around. Hmm. We're having trouble finding this site. I'm shocked. All right, let's try this again. Hey, there we go. All right, first thing I don't like is there's not even a default password. Uh, admin is all that you get. <laughs> just admin for the username, no password. And for setup, I'm just gonna follow exactly what they tell me to do. So they say, go to the wizard and we're gonna set this up as a LAN bridge, which is your typical access point mode. We're gonna leave it named wavelink-n and I'm gonna use a WPA passkey. Sorry, WPA2 passkey, don't use WPA. And for a Wi-Fi password, we'll just do something very simple. And please wait a few seconds while we get this set up. All right, here's hoping. Now here's one thing I don't like right off. Not only did they not have me type in my Wi-Fi password twice to confirm that's actually what I wanted to use, but in the confirmation screen, they didn't obfuscate my Wi-Fi password. It's not the biggest deal in the world, but I also don't want someone looking over my shoulder when I'm potentially setting up, you know, a dozen of these. Okay, and now that that is set up, uh, this no longer has DHCP or DNS. So in theory, I should be able to plug it into my home network and have an access point. We'll see if that works. All right, so I unplugged from the laptop and ran a cable over to my desk. So it is now plugged into my switch and the access point has been rebooted. So in theory, this should now be on my local network. So we'll go up to our Wi-Fi configuration here and there's our Wavelink N, so it is broadcasting. Let's see if I get a connection. There we go. I am connected and in fact got a local IP address, so that's a good sign. Let's go ahead and uh, open Firefox and let's do a little bit of a speed test here. That's really not a terrible result. Uh, considering we're on wireless N 2.4 gigahertz, I'd say 78 megabit is right up there with what you would typically expect. Now, a lot of people, when they do speed tests on Wi-Fi, they expect a 300 megabit network to perform at 300 megabit. The thing is, it doesn't work that way. Well, it does and it doesn't. You see, almost 50% of your throughput is lost to overhead in the Wi-Fi protocol. That means if you have a 300 megabit connection, you'll actually only ever see a max throughput from a device of about 150 megabit, because the rest is being used to negotiate and keep the stream alive between the client device and the access point. What's more is any minor interruption in Wi-Fi signaling or any other clients connected to the same access point will seriously degrade your overall quality very, very quickly. So for a $30 access point, 80 megabit, I'll take that. But 80 megabit also isn't that impressive considering I'm literally like two feet from the access point itself. And this is meant to be an outdoor access point. So what do you say we go on a little field trip and see if this actually performs well outdoors like it's supposed to. Here we are outside. And as you can see, I've got the access point mounted right up here and I just zip tied it to my gutter. And I would feel just fine leaving that for long-term installations. As I mentioned, you can also put a couple of screws into a block of wood or whatever else and get it mounted up the same way with the exact same bracket. And I do really like that mounting system. Now, one thing when running your Cat5e or Cat6 cable is you will need to crimp your own if you plan on using the rubber gasket in here. And in fact, you probably need to crimp your own if you plan on running any of the lower housing because an RJ45 plug will not fit through the bottom of this lower coupler or the rubber gasket right here. But we are all mounted up here and I do have it connected to my phone. So I'm just gonna do a very simple test. Do a speed test right here, walk 30 feet away, do another speed test and walk until I no longer get a signal. So let's see how far this thing will actually reach. So there you can see we are connected to the Wavelink N and uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and do the same thing that I did inside with my laptop and that is go to fast.com, which is the Netflix speed test server. And standing right next to it, we're getting about 31 megabit or so down, which again, for a device like this outside, probably acceptable if you're just wanting to avoid using cell phone data. And of course, while I'm talking, we drop down to five and a half megabit. 
And that latency is not terrific. 333 millisecond loaded latency. Uh, we are getting 30 megabit up, although based on that, I can tell you we're probably dropping a fair number of packets here. According to my fancy little uh, laser ruler here, uh, we are about 33 feet away from the access point. So let's go ahead and try this again. All right, this is more in line with what I was expecting to get. Uh, so we're getting about 50 megabit download and about 35 to 40 megabit upload, which is actually starting to hit the upper end of my upload speed. Uh, our latency also dropped all the way down to 143 milliseconds. So uh, much, much better latency. Again, we're just trying to use a cell phone out here. We're not trying to do anything fancy. So 30 feet, I'll give that a pass. And again, I've doubled the distance. I'm here at 60 feet or about 708 inches. So not 60, 60, close enough. All right, let's try this again. 3.9 and uh, not much else. 1.9, uh, latency is now measuring in the multiples of seconds to tell you how many packets we're dropping. All right, three megabit and 2.5 second loaded latency time. Not great, not, uh, not great. And in fact, while standing right in this very spot, my Wi-Fi just switched over to my home Wi-Fi network. Uh, so my internal access points, which admittedly are ubiquity, are getting more power to this location than my outdoor access point with two antennas much, much closer. It is conclusion time for the Wavelink 300 megabit outdoor wireless access point. Uh, the best endorsement that I can give it is that it worked as a wireless access point up to about 30 feet. But is that really the range you're looking for if you want to hang one of these outside? By 60 feet, the signal had degraded to the point of being completely unusable. So my argument would be, no, I expect to get more than 30 feet of range from an access point, regardless of the manufacturer of it. And just for a quick point of comparison, I went ahead and did a speed test standing in that exact same location from my Unify access point, which is hanging inside my house above the stairs, and I got 46 megabit with 24 megabit upload and only 219 milliseconds of total latency under load. So a much better result, obviously from a much more expensive wireless access point in the AC Nano, but I'd be better off just using Wi-Fi from that 60 feet away than I am from this outside. And one more thing to note, again, this is not the first of these that I've set up. Uh, I have this one right here. And the reason I have this one is this wireless access point failed to get me a signal past five feet. And I mean five feet. So do I recommend this product? Absolutely not. This is definitely one to avoid. There may be some wireless access points down in this price range that might be worth it for you, but this is definitely not one of them. If you're interested in taking a look at it anyway, I will have affiliate links down in the video description, as well as some Unify access points that I do recommend for outdoor use, starting at about $100 a piece. On your way down there, if you liked this video, make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description. That's going to do for me in this one, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers and perfect timing because it's starting to rain. Beer for today is from Crux Fermentation Project. It is the Crux Stout. Now, Crux around here is more known for their sours and wild ales and things like that. Uh, their stout, as far as I know, was not canned prior to 2020. So, at least 2020 brought us something good. This is clocking in at 7.7%. And even a slightly aggressive pour got me one heck of a thick head here. John working at Crux now? A not so rainy day, American Stout. Stouts have a rich, deep, and dark history, dating back over 400 years in Europe as a strong porter. Well, forget all that. Yes, this stout is classically dark, but close your eyes and take a sip. You'll likely be surprised by how easy it is on the palate with notes of caramel, chocolate, and roasted coffee, driven by a wonderfully nuanced blend of dark crystal, black roasted, and chocolate malt. You won't have patience to save this one for a rainy day. So 
I'll let this one warm up quite a bit because with this chilled down to fridge temperature, it was actually very bittering and almost sour on the back end. Not like it's a bad stout or it had gone bad in the can or anything like that. It's just the roast at a cold temperature just wasn't working. Now warmed up, this has sweetened up quite significantly. And now instead of that, that super sour, bittering, black coffee-like finish to it, it's actually a much warmer roast of a flavor. A uh, little bit fuller bodied, uh, almost smoky in, in the way it's coming across. But none of the flavors in this are overly intense or overly complex. It's a fairly simple stout. I will say off the can, I'm not getting the caramel. Uh, lots of chocolate, lots of chocolate. Dark chocolate's probably the primary flavor that I'm getting. Uh, there's no nuttiness to it. There's no, the, the roast is kind of mild. Overall, it's not bad. Uh, I think if this was on draft, it's something I would have a little bit more often, but out of the can, it's just kind of, uh, it's all right. Yeah. Nah, that's a stupid test. How do I want to test this? Probably need to go outside. Which means I need to put on pants. <laughs>